Since Channel 7 was Austin's first and for many years only commercial television station, we've had an eye on Austin from a unique perspective. So pull up a chair and reminisce with us. Thanksgiving Day 1952, the annual Turkey Day battle between Texas and Texas A&M had a lot riding on it as usual. A win by the Longhorns would wrap up the Southwest Conference Championship for Texas and send them to the Cotton Bowl. But this game would go down in history for another reason. It introduced Austinites to a wonderful new piece of technology called television. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I remember the day they signed on the air. Uh, our family had moved from Everett, Washington to Austin in the summer of 1952. We lived on Bentwood Road out near the airport. And I remember vividly watching the A&M Texas game on Thanksgiving Day in 52. The Longhorns made it a smashing debut for Austin's new television station. They beat the Aggies, 32 to 12, and the station's first day went off without a hitch. You know, it's hard to think of life without television now, but in 1952, no one was really sure what would happen. The day before Thanksgiving, they got it all working. And for some reason or other, I was selected to stay up all night with the transmitter and keep a test pattern on the air just to make sure it was going to work the next day. Tension you could almost cut with a knife. That big old tower, is it securely built? Will it, uh, will it work all right? Have we got uh, all the engineering, all of the technical knowledge cued in? It was a tense time. The Johnsons brought in a team of RCA engineers from New York to install the transmitter and tower. And at the time, it was the tallest structure in Central Texas. The whole operation was the very best that money could buy, except for the studio. If there were to be a commercial on the news, and incident we had a two-man anchor team, Lyman Jones and Paul Bolton. But if it was to be a commercial, the announcer had to get under the table. It was that small. And I was frequent the announcer. And I really would get under the table and then say, uh, they'd break the news for a commercial. They'd put the black up in front of the lens, and I would pop up. In front of the news? Do the commercial, they'd get back and smell their feet for the rest of the newscast. And I understand uh, that the first, uh, the transmitter building built on top of Mount Larson was the studio at the very it beginning. It was, and it was just a little cinder block building, a little bitty one. And it had the kind of a, a glass-fronted segment, little closet, and that is where you broadcast from. And the whole thing was midget-sized, and the road to it it was very precipitous, um, winding, rocky in the winter. If there was sleet, you just wondered if you were going to get up and <laughs> tumble off down the side. The station operated out of its transmitter site atop Mount Larson overlooking Austin for the first six months or so, but then it moved into the historic Driscoll Hotel downtown. Now, this was where the studio was. Yeah, this was the studio, and... Uh, the weather set was right there. And then right here where the instruments are is where we had a, a young entertainer who wore black leather and long sideburns by the name of uh, Elvis Presley. And uh, Came in before the big time. And I, he was play, playing Dust All Dance Hall that night. Yes, that's right. And I made the profound observation that this kid would never get anywhere. <laughs> In 1961, the station was again bursting at the seams, so the company bought the old YWCA building at the corner of 10th and Brazos, and Channel 7 had finally found a permanent home. In 1961, Channel 7's owners also moved into a new home, the Vice President's Mansion in Washington, D.C. And in a moment, Central Texas watches as one of its own makes the climb to the White House. Uh, Will Rogers once said that... Uh uh, I'm a member of uh, no organized party. I'm a Democrat. Welcome back to Channel 7's 40th anniversary special. You know, I guess it would be impossible to talk about the history of KTBC-TV without some mention of the Channel 7 original owners, the Johnson family. Channel 7 was actually owned by Lady Bird Johnson, but LBJ had a say in the operation of the station, and his presence and influence were greatly felt. Every child born in the... I never will forget, he was president of the United States. 
and he was back in Austin, and he called me. He says, Cactus, I heard you do that Cash Carry Store, uh, Cash Carry Store commercial on the radio today. That's a pretty good job, but make it a little peppier, he said. What, whatever you think about us, we really don't manage the press. <laughs> we don't manage the press. We had uh, KLBJ Radio. Well, it was KTBC Radio at that time. Uh, in the same building at the Driscoll. And Jack Wallace was uh, one of the announcers. And uh, he also played on the Uncle Jay show as Packer Jack. But he was on one weekend, and President Johnson called up to request a number and said, uh, Mr. Wallace, this is President Johnson, and I'd like for you to play. And Jack Wallace said, yeah, and I'm the Queen of Sheba, and hung up. And <laughs> the next uh, call they got was from Jesse Kellum, who was our general manager, and said, you hung up on the president. And Jack Wallace said, I'll leave immediately. And he said, no, I suggest you play what he wants to play. If they would let me climb up there to where those television cameras are, I would like to shout this from the rooftop. He would come in and he would um, assist Lady Bird by holding staff meetings and uh, chewing rear end like only LBJ could, and he would get results, dramatic results, if sales were slacking a little bit. And quite frankly, there were a lot of people who bought time on this television station who might not have bought it otherwise. Uh, American Airlines, I think, was advertising on this station when before they flew into Austin, Long Texas. Pretty, <laughs> could he be pretty persuasive when he wanted to, to sell time? Uh, he, uh, yes, he was persuasive to the extent, too, that you kind of respected his position. And, you know, you don't have to hit with as uh, hard a lick if you have a big hammer. <laughs> Those who worked at Channel 7 got an up-close and personal perspective on our nation's future president. And the rest of Central Texas had a front-row seat to watch LBJ's climb up the ladder of political power. By the late 50s, LBJ was Senate Majority Leader and thinking seriously about running for president. In 1960, the Democrats instead chose a young senator from Massachusetts. But John F. Kennedy realized he needed some help to win the South, and specifically Texas. So, as Austin watched, LBJ was nominated for the vice president's office. I've reached the conclusion it would be the best judgment of the convention to nominate Senator Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas for the office of vice president.